I'm Kyle Simpson. I go by Getify. Um, you probably know me better by that way. Um, so this title, uh, JSUI, not only was it because I like the matrix, but also this has kind of a hidden meaning. Um, what we're going to talk about today, this JavaScript UI architecture stuff, it, is, it exists in every single web application, but it's kind of hidden. Most people don't think about it. We don't give it a name. We don't talk about it. But it is oftentimes the biggest pain point in, in applications. So that's kind of the uh, back story. Come on now. You were just working a second ago. Is this still working? All right. Well, I guess I'm not going to be able to use that. All right. So, um, dude, where's my UI architecture? That's the title of today's talk. So what the heck is UI architecture? I mean all the stuff that it takes to process, package, deliver, get together your presentation layer and get it up to the browser from the server. This involves things like templating, URL routing, data validation, data formatting, AJAX, even stuff like caching. I didn't put that on the slide. All those things are part of what I call the middle end. So this is in between the front end and the back end. So let's take a look at a, a um, existing web application architecture diagram. I just kind of whipped this together. This is by no means definitive, but this is kind of representative of how a lot of web application architectures work. So some things to point out here real quick. Um, we've got the client browser over here with the JavaScript in the application, and it's very, very separate and very, very siloed from the rest of what's going on in the web application. Um, the typical pattern here is that this JS application re-implements to some degree and sometimes to a great degree the stuff that's going on down here. So we've got two different views of what our application are. It's what's happening in the browser and what's happening on the server. This is kind of a, uh, a way to visualize the typical MVC stack. We've got a web server layer sitting on top. This is IIS. This is Apache and Genix. Even if you're really clever, this is Node.js. Uh, and then we've got some controller and application logic stuff. If you're using .NET, Java, whatever platform you can insert, this is entirely agnostic of which technology you're choosing. But this layer is the one that sits there. It, it intercepts the request from the web server, and it controls everything that's going to happen. Uh, then down here at the bottom, we have the view, the templating engine, the things that put together what we're going to see, the presentation layer, and sitting in between them, the model, and it communicates with our database. So what is my motivation for mucking with this? Because this pattern has been around for a long time. Number one, performance. I'm a huge performance geek. A lot of my projects are about that, uh, Lab.js and other things like that. So um, my biggest concern is that I go to companies, companies that I work at, or companies that have asked me to consult on these topics, and I try to convince them that what they need to do is just do something crazy like optimize the markup that their application sends out to the browser. Not too complicated, right? And what's the universal response I get back? Oh, I can't change that markup. There's some compiled widget way down deep inside of my architecture that does that for me. And I would never dream of changing the way that grid control works. It surely is in control of that markup. This sucks. This really, really sucks. Even simple things like, hey, can you put a different doc type on your page so that you can have some standards to your web application? No, I can't control that stuff. So performance sucks when you have no control over what's happening. We need more control. So that's the first motivation. The second one, MVC. Now, I'm going to pick on MVC a little bit, but as you'll see at the end, I'm not really telling you that MVC is wrong. I'm just trying to kind of evolve some of these concepts a little bit. So this is an example. I'm going to pick on PHP, but this kind of code happens in every platform. Um, so, so some things to look at here. We're obviously we're inside of a view. We're in an HTML page or a PHP page in this case. We're in a view, and what we've got is we want to conditionally show some link to some page. We only want to show that when some condition is true of our backend logic. In this case, we got really clever. We've got an object-oriented model. We've got a user. And that model has a function on it called is logged in. That's kind of opaque. We're not exactly sure what is logged in means, but it's probably checking for a login session, maybe some credentials. And then over here, we've got the permissions-based side of things that not only are they logged in, but there's a particular permission or set of permissions that we have arbitrarily decided means that they can publish. And if both of those conditions are true, then we want to show this link. Now, this is perfectly valid logic. The problem is, this is terrible to put in your templates. Because as soon as you write this code, 
three weeks later, somebody in your biz dev side of your company is going to come along and tell you, well, actually, can publish is not really the whole world. We need one more condition on top of can publish. We need this, or we need that, or, or you're going to have back-end developers that are going to go through and refactor your model, and these function names are going to change, or the meaning of what they do is going to get overloaded, and all of a sudden, your templates and your back-end application architecture are terribly intertwined. This is exactly what MVC tells us to get away from, to have loose uh, mixture between our views and our, and our models and things like that. But unfortunately, this just happens all the time. So my third motivation is dry. Do not repeat yourself. I am such a lazy developer, and I'm just going to go right out there and say it. I do not like to write code more than once. I really, I want that utopia where I can write code once, and it's going to freaking run anywhere I want it to run, and I don't have to worry about it. And the last thing is, uh, we all wear a lot of different hats. Um, some people are, get, the, get the privilege of specializing in the front end or specializing in the back end. Many times people are having to wear multiple hats. They're having to do some front end back, uh, some front end development, some back end development. And the problem is that when you are doing back end development, uh, you're thinking like a back end developer. That's a good thing, but it's a terrible thing for the front end because system architecture is entirely different, so very much orthogonal and opposite in ways to front end development and the concerns of the front end, and the reverse is also true. So when you have to wear these hats, you have to keep context switching and thinking of entirely different worlds. And this is what leads to the crap of, I've got a widget that you know, builds out my markup, and because I'm a back end developer, I don't want to worry about the box model and CSS and markup standards and all of that crap, so I'm going to bury that deep down inside of my Java code so I never have to worry about it again, but then I have lost complete control. So my motivation here is that we need to allow, when you are a front-end developer, when you're wearing that hat, you need to be able to stay inside of that core skill set and get your job done fast and get it done efficiently and get it done right. When you're a back-end developer, the same is true. So we need a different view on this, and I am proposing what I call a new pattern. It's not exactly a replacement of MVC, but we're going to talk about some differences. I call it CVC. Stands for Clients Views Controllers or Client View Controller. So this is a slightly different view of the world. Um, we're going to talk about CVC UI architecture here for a moment. So this is a UI focused architecture and it separates out the tiers. It creates an explicit middle end UI architecture layer um, that you may or may not be very familiar with seeing. So the first thing that I want you to recognize here is that down here at the bottom, everything that was in that prior diagram that was all over here and all intermixed becomes this black box. This is our application. And now our application doesn't know anything at all about how things are going to be presented. It is 100% an API-based application. All it is is a state machine. All it is is concerned with dealing with state, with managing your login sessions, with connecting to the database, and doing whatever magic that system backends do. We stick a simple um, JSON serializing API on top of that, and the whole rest of the world becomes beautiful for the UI engineer. JSON is an awesome representation of data. It's the only representation of data that's truly native recognizable in all of our other tiers. Um, and every application is able to serialize down to JSON. Uh, then what we have over here, the most important thing, is that what now is in control of what's going on on our server is what I call the UI controllers. And I am implementing these in JavaScript. This is why I'm talking about it at a JavaScript conference. So what I am going to do is I'm going to write everything that the middle end is in JavaScript, all of this. And then the cool part is this thing over here, this templating engine, and even some of these things, they can work over here in the browser the exact same code. I don't have to write different code. Things like data validation, I can write that once and run it in both places um, instead of having to have you know, some, something that auto-generates JavaScript for me. So I just want to switch back to this one for just a moment and then back so that you see the differences. We're making a UI-focused architecture here. I'm not telling you what you need to do with this black box other than stop having this thing do crappy presentation. Whatever platform you're working on, .NET, I really don't care. It could be Perl. I feel bad for you, but it could be whatever you want it to be. All I'm telling you is that your presentation layer and your middle end probably sucks right now, and maybe you should rethink it. 
So let's talk about what CVC means clients. Everything is a client of everything else. They're decoupled, they're modular, and they're scalable. That means at any point in the flow, everything is able to talk to everything else, and it uses JSON. The views, they're templating, they're portable, they're dry, they're platform agnostic, and they use the core web technology that UI engineers are most familiar with, the JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. The controllers are all these little tiny things that make all this stuff work. This is the thing that takes a request and translates it into an execution of the view engine and grabs the JSON data from the application and pumps it in and packages all the stuff up. It caches things. Those are what the UI controllers are doing. They're small, independent, and powerful. They're also in JavaScript. So what I'm not suggesting is that we need another framework. Um, so this is actually the anti-framework presentation. Uh, none of what I am doing is going to automatically build you some UI. We just heard a talk on EXTJS, and they do a phenomenal job of packaging all that stuff up and making it so that you don't really have to think about it much. I actually want to do the reverse. I want you to have to think about it. So you can build on top of this pattern. Um, Whatever kind of presentation layer is cool with you, you can use jQuery, EXT, Dojo, whatever you want to do, um, but make sure that you use a templating system that can run in both places. I'm not telling you to ditch your whole architecture. As I said, you can go and you can go back to your company, uh, you know, Monday morning, and you can tell them, "Hey, I just want to change the views. I don't have to change the entire platform architecture." And I'm also not saying that M MVC is inherently wrong or that it's weak or something like that. I'm just simply saying that in our world of Web 2.0 and with the role separations and specialties that we all are falling into in our jobs, it's time that we rethink this a little bit and I'm suggesting an extension to that pattern. CVC is an alternate pattern for thinking about UI architecture and it is okay to rethink. You do not have to accept the status quo because you've always been a .NET shop and you've never been given the option of doing anything other than that. It's okay to go back and rethink things. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use JavaScript, which is awesome. And it's going to be on the server primarily. There's going to be some in the, in the browser as well. Sometimes JavaScript on the server can feel a little bit out of, the, out of a, a fish out of water kind of a thing in today's day and age. We're really pushing things and you're seeing some awesome stuff from Node.js and Narwhal and Rhino and all these awesome things. Um, and we're trying to get them to kind of all work together. CommonJS is doing a great job of giving us some standards um, for how all of these things work. Uh, the problem is that we haven't progressed very far yet. So you've got something awesome like Node.js and they've gone and done like 18 or 20 different APIs for all these awesome things. And only two or three of them are things that everybody's kind of agreed on in the common JS world. Uh, so that's why you're seeing so much API that's changing with Node, and it's, and it's also a problem. Narwhal's a little bit more mature, but it's also a problem there. So uh, the world of server-side JavaScript is still kind of a wild, wild west, and, and we've got some issues to work through there. Um, but I believe wholeheartedly in JavaScript on the server, and uh, I think it's the answer to a lot of our problems. So I'm prepared to be on that forefront, and we're going we're gonna to stub our toe a few times. It's going to suck, but we're going to eventually come to something that is freaking amazing. So I'm going to propose, I'm, I've written some code that I call Bike Change AS. Um, this is a much more simplified view of what server-side JavaScript would be. It is not at all intended to replace or compete with Node.js, but I needed something simple and a little bit more <coughs> tangible to work with when I'm demoing and kind of developing some of these ideas. So this just wraps around V8. It's a single engine file. It's a single compilable. It creates a very simple, straightforward server-side JavaScript environment. And it uses the module approach that the others are familiar with using. I talked extensively with Chris Kowal and some of the others from the common JS world. I wanted to make sure that what I implemented was as close as possible to what the common JS world is wanting to agree on. And because all I needed were things like file I.O., system I.O., and a few process execution things, those are the things that everybody's kind of agreed on. So that's the good news. The bad news is you're not going to be able to use bike chain JS to do Comet servers and all kinds of freaking amazing stuff. But I actually don't think that that's necessary for most of the web's UI architecture. So bike chain JS is really just kind of a temporary stopgap. Uh, hopefully it'll evolve kind of in parallel with some of the others. And it's a good synchronous simple environment to get started, and then you can graduate to running this code in something more sophisticated like Node or Narwhal. 
C B C plus JavaScript is the power of the UI architecture put in the hands of the people that need it most, the front end engineers. Instead of relying on your system architect who has no clue what it actually means to optimize markup and CSS and AJAX communication, you put it in the hands of those who work with that every single day and you give them the control to make things better. My templating engine I call Handlebar JS. This is actually patterned, um, significantly inspired by Mustache JS. Um, so I'm going to give full credit to them. They really were um, some pioneers in this realm. This is a primarily HTML text-based templating approach. It uses a very simple wrapper around that, a very simple small DSL for templating. My basic idea was I need the bare minimum that it takes to get templating done. I don't need to bring a huge machine gun to a knife fight. So I'm not going to give the full power of JavaScript to the templating engine. That's going to, what's going to la lead to that spaghetti code we dealt with before. Um, so Handlebar JS is very stripped down and simple. And it uses only JSON data for the input. So we're not dealing with inexorable communication between our model and the way our model works and the way the front end works. If you've ever dealt with this, I deal with this all the time. You know, For whatever reason, the back end architecture, they want to do things as a keyed hash. And when I get it in the front end and I want to iterate over it, it needs to be an array because I need it to be ordered for whatever presentational reason. This sucks that we have to have those two be the same thing. And the problem is that we're trying to replicate the model that the back end guys use in the front end, and that's not how things work in the front end. So if we serialize things down to JSON, it makes things a lot simpler. We can agree upon that serialization, and then it's kind of like creating an interface for your data. That interface doesn't have to change no matter what the back end guys do. And if you need a little bit of a tweak to that in your front end, you're in control of tweaking that serialization. So the details, this is 100% JavaScript, runs both in the browser and the server. It only accepts JSON data, not models and behavior. The application state, this is an arbitrary string value that represents the state of your application, this, the state that that black box is currently in. That's going to, what's going to select which template to use. And finally, for performance reasons, one step that I've already built into Handlebar JS, even though it's kind of young and, and immature, one step that I've built into it is that it compiles your text template. So when it does all of this, you know, complicated and expensive regular expression parsing on text, a lot of these template engines are just-in-time compilers, and they do that over and over and over again. And Handlebar JS can run in just-in-time, but it also will cache the results of that into executable JavaScript so you can run that as a build process. So you can still maintain your templates in HTML the way it ought to be, but you get the performance benefit of being able to run optimized JavaScript. So let's take a look at a demo. If you want to go and check out jsconf10.getify.com, that is this page. I will tell you that at the bottom of this, there are two links. There, oh, you can't see the second one. There's a demo comments thread. That's what we're going to look at in just a moment. And then right below that, there's a slides link. This is substantially the same um, presentation that I gave last month at South by Southwest Interactive. And so my slide set from that is up still on SlideShare. So you're going to see most of the same slides here if you want to check out my slides. Let's go over and take a look at this demo. This is a very simple demo, and I encourage all of you to be participating in this demo. It'll be cooler if more of you are logging in and doing things. So uh, basically, the setup of this demo is I've got this image, and I've got 10 different randomly selected images that come from Flickr. And I can just change those at will. What I'm doing, actually, is I'm using Handlebar.js. Handlebar.js was used to build this page on the server when I first requested it. And then when I click this Change Image, I'm doing an AJAX request, and I'm saying, give me some JSON back that tells me what's the new image that's been randomly selected from the server, the details, its source, and alt, and all of that stuff. And then I'm rebuilding that markup using the templating on the front end. So it's very simple, but you can see that it's going quick. So whichever image you happen to have picked, when you type in your name, and you type in some URL, and you click Login, it's going to create a login session for you. And you can type in a comment. So I'm going to say, hey, nice bench, and submit that comment. All that, the, that, that is happening here is using that handlebar JS. I'm going to show you some code here in just a moment. Um, but everything that just happened there, there were AJAX requests that were going back and forth, but they were only sending JSON back and forth. 
the markup was actually being built on the fly using the same templating engine in the browser as what I use on the server. So if I were to refresh this page, the exact same process of querying the application for that data would happen, and the server-side templating engine would be responsible for, for building this page. So if several of you have already added comments, which I'm guessing probably you have, if I, oops, if I refresh this page, so now I know that several of you have already made comments, that request happened on the server. So I can do templating in both places using exactly the same templates. I can also do data validation in both places because I know for a fact that I have a rule that if I type in a really short comment like this, it's going to do some data validation. Now what's cool about this is that data validation code, which I'll show in just a moment if I have time, that data validation code, very simple, it just looked at the, the minimum length of my text field. That ran in the browser, gave me an immediate request, but that same code can also run on the server because we know we can't trust the JavaScript in the browser. So I did not have to write that rule twice, I only wrote it once. So it needs to be at least five characters, so then when I resubmit, everything's going to work fine. All right, so let's take a look at some code. First of all, using Handlebar.js. This is intended to be very simple. A lot of this stuff is wrapped up inside of the code. So here you can see that all I'm doing is I'm calling Handlebar, and I'm calling a function called process state. I'm giving it that arbitrary string value which represents the state of the application. In this case, uh, I know there's a login error, so I know what that state is. And I'm passing it a JSON data structure. And then I'm using this fancy thing called promises, server-side defers, things like that. So it's not really particularly important exactly how this happens, but basically this can be an asynchronous operation or synchronous depending on the environment and what's happening. And so all I really want to know is either immediately or later if necessary, I want to do something after this completes. So after I've processed that state, then I'm going to get passed to me the uh, value, the results of that templating process. And so I'm just going to use some very simple jQuery to replace the existing form with what the results of my templating engine were. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. I use that templating engine as an engine to grab me the markup and combine it with that data and it used the optimized pre-compiled JavaScript version of the template. All right, so Handlebar JS, just to show a couple of things, this is just, there's actually several JavaScript files, but of course you can combine them all together. Um, it's really nothing more than a bunch of fancy, you know, um, regular expressions and processing and things, but I'm essentially generating my JavaScript right here. That's what I'm doing is I'm just building up strings of JavaScript that represent the optimized output of your text templates. Let's take a look at what some of those templates might look like. So if you're interested in my particular approach to templating. Um, so this is a master template file. You can see here at the top that I declare a template section. That's what this dollar sign colon is and I give it a name. I use kind of the uh, CSS approach here so IDs have the pound. Yeah. And then I have my doc type here and of course I know that I ebug. I've got no white space before my doc type. Uh, but then I just am substantially doing HTML, and then here I'm going to drop in a sub-template, a style sub-template, that's what the at symbol does. Down later you see in the body I've got dropping in the content and footer sub-templates. So uh, this is my master template for every page on this site, of course there's only one right now, but uh, my individual template, template.index.html, um, by the way file names doesn't matter, you can have whatever you want it to be. But here I'm basically saying I'm going, I'm going to extend sort of simple object-oriented extension, if you will. I'm extending that master template, and I'm going to um, basically here declare some, some values that are going to happen at runtime when this sub-template is called, but all these do are going to select other sub-templates. So there's no mathematics going on or data formatting or any other logic that you don't want to have here. The only logic that happens is presentational logic deciding which templates need to happen. So for instance, when I'm logged in, I'm going to show a different set of, or when there's comments, I'm going to show a different template than when there's not comments. Um, I wanted to show you real quick, I'm, I'm kind of running short, a little short on time, but I want to show you real quick a couple of other pieces of code. So this is that validation code that I was talking about. This is very, very simple. I just wrote some, some functions that, um, that I can run in both places. You can do whatever validation you want as long as it's not, you know, tied to there being a DOM, as long as it deals with JSON data values, then you can run it in both places. Here I just have a different one for the full name property and the URL property and I can apply rules at will. And this code will run in both places. 
Same is true of formatting. I didn't really express that much, but when I'm, for, when I'm getting data back from, a, from an AJAX request, I need to format that on the fly. I need to make sure that HTML characters are properly escaped and things like that. So that's another thing that the URL or the UI architecture does usually for you, and you have full control over this now. You can pass it into a formatting function and replace your characters and all of those things. And you can do that either in the browser or on the server. Last thing, full disclosure, um, the back end of this application, the black box of this application is a PHP file. Um, when I gave this demo at South by Southwest, it actually crashed, and then I went back and I was like, man, that sucks. Why did it crash halfway through my demo? Some of it worked, and then it didn't. And as I discovered, it was the PHP that crashed. So all the JavaScript was awesome, and it worked, and it was the PHP that sucked. So full disclosure, there is some PHP going on, but this is only doing the crappy stuff of you know, managing my sessions and all of that other crap, but the last line is the important one. It just encodes it to JSON and spits it out, and the rest of the world is beautiful for JavaScript. Last thing on full disclosure is to say that at the moment, I'm still experimenting with the jump between a web request and an execution context for JavaScript. This is called the, the gateway interface. It goes by JSGI in the JavaScript world. There are JSGI things like V8 CGI that can do this automatically for you. I'm trying to evaluate the best way to do this. It's basically how do you translate a set of HTTP headers into an execution context for JavaScript. So at the moment, I have some really terrible, ugly PHP that's doing it. But that's the only part that's actually happening in the stack that's PHP and very soon this crap is going to go away. And basically all this is doing, again for full disclosure, is I'm simply executing my JavaScript here and calling my engine and passing it a JavaScript file. So that's really all the PHP is doing. But I took advantage of the fact that PHP is pretty good about giving me those headers and session management and all those things. Um, so we've got like one or two minutes left. Um, and I think that's substantially what I wanted to show for the presentation. Are there um, any last questions? Yeah. Um, I really like the idea. I never thought MVC worked in the Rails world because the view was actually an MVC within itself. <laughs> um, but have you thought about putting this on like HouchDB since that does the JSON only for you and doing it that way? So I'm a huge fan of server-side JavaScript, and there's a lot of different ways to take it. It's going to make sense for some companies to go with that architecture. Some of them it's not. For instance, if you're in the .NET world, you really want the smallest footprint of change to that architecture as possible because it's really hard to adapt things in that world. Um, so for them, it wouldn't make sense to go with a really complex you know, CouchDB and Node.js kind of thing because they're going to have to rethink their entire world. But if you can just tell them, run some synchronous JavaScript in this small little sandbox, give that control to your front-end developers and let the back-end developers only worry about data and session management, things I think can prove a little bit. But I think there's certainly a use case for some more forward-thinking or more experimental companies that want to go full-fledged, totally JavaScript on the server, and all of this code should work exactly perfectly in that type of environment. Good question. Anybody else? Awesome. Go forth and rethink your UI architecture. There is a middle end. It's time to give it a name. So thanks a lot.